Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the program today. I know you will enjoy meeting Jay Ryan Straddle. We're very honored that he is presenting this for the Pasadena Public Library as part of our Authors and Their Journey series. You probably have gone on our webpage and um, seen all of the author events um, that are listed in Off the Shelf. And I didn't wanted to make sure that you knew that all of these authors donate their services to the library, which is very generous of them. And um, we thank them very much for doing that for us. So in order to um, have the best experience today, please mute yourself. Um, Jay Ryan has agreed to um, having us record the program and it will be on the Pasadena Library's YouTube. Um, so you can view it um, sometime tomorrow and tell your friends about it in case they were not able to attend today. Um, please put your questions in chat. How the program will work is the same format if you've attended any of our programs before. I will welcome and introduce our author, Jay Ryan Straddle, and then he will talk about his writing experience and his book. Following that, we will have chat questions. So, so throughout the program, if you would like to, please put your um, questions in chat and we'll have a chat question um, session afterwards. So thank you very much for doing that. Also, we um, have live transcript today. You need to set that up yourself on your own computer and it's at the bottom, if you can please look to see that. Um, so I think we have a few more people coming in. So we'll wait till everyone is here before we start. But I wanted to remind you that we have other author events coming up. So please um, go to our Off the Shelf um, for August and soon our September and October Off the Shelf will be available for your review. So um, as I said, Jay Ryan Straddle is part of our Authors and Our Journey series for his second book, The Logger Queen of Minnesota. We have the book in the Pasadena Public Library for you to check out. You can go to your local favorite branch, check it out, or you can put it on hold. You can also get a copy for yourself at Roman's Bookstore in Pasadena. You know that his first book, was um, the, the great the kitchens of the great Midwest. Both of his books, as soon as they came out, rocketed to the bestseller list. So I understand he's in the process of writing another book, which I am sure is going to go to the top of the um, bestseller list as well. All of these books take place in the Midwest. The Logger Queen of Minnesota is a novel of family. Midwestern Values, Hard Work and Fate. Um, it is his second book. It is um, a story of two sisters, one farm and a family that split when their father leaves their shared inheritance entirely to Helen, his younger daughter. Despite baking award-winning pies at the local nursing home, her older sister, Edith, struggles to make what most people would call a living. So she can't help wondering what her life would be and what it would have been like when an even a portion of the farm money her sister kept for herself. In the book, the reader meets a cast of lovable, funny, quintessential American characters eager to make their mark in a world that's often stacked against them. In this, Deeply affecting family saga, resolution can take generations. But when it finally comes, many are surprised, moved, and delighted. J. Ryan Straddle grew up in the Midwest, in the southern town of Hastings, where he often failed his driver's license exam, it said. He graduated from Northwestern University, where he often slipped on ice. He doesn't own a gu gun and a motorcycle which makes him very, very unique among his extended family. And we get down to the chat questions. We're gonna ask him about how much he loves the library and what it meant to him and how he grew up 
um, going to the library and now his son, 20 year old son does as well. This second novel, The Logger Queen of Minnesota was published by Viking Pamela Dorman Books in July of 2019. It received starred reviews from Kirkus, Booklist and Bookpage. It became a national bestseller its first week of release and was named one of the best books of the year by NPR, USA Today, Booklist, Paste, and the Texas Library Association, among other places. So when the book came out in 2019, if you can imagine, he did a 61 stop book tour that took him to bookstores, libraries, and breweries in 15 states between July and December. The TV rights for the Logger Queen are presently being negotiated and perhaps we will soon see it on TV. Um, in, 19, in 2020, it was named the winner of the Willa Literary Award by Women Writing the West to honor the best in literature that features women or girls stories set in the West. And it was a finalist for the Heartland Booksellers Award. He lives in Los Angeles and we are delighted to welcome him today. So he's going to talk about his book and share lots of details and then we'll have the chat questions afterwards. So please put your questions in chat. Welcome, Jay Ryan. Thank hey. you for joining us today. <laughs> Thanks so much, Christine. It's a real honor to be here, to be doing an event with the Pasadena Public Library. It's still surreal to me as a kid who grew up sitting on the floor of libraries across Southern Minnesota, reading books, feeling like books came from another planet. Uh, it wasn't until college that I even met anyone who had written a book and it was because I had a professor who assigned a book they had written. <laughs> so uh, it feels, it still feels weird to me uh, to be speaking to a library crowd instead of just being where I'm most comfortable, which is among the stacks looking at spines. So yeah, I grew up in a small town in Minnesota, a series of them. Uh, moved to Hastings with my family when I was five, and that's where I graduated from high school. So I consider Hastings, Minnesota, my hometown. I, I saw at least one person comment, Dane Anderson, I saw you comment that Minnesota, awesome. And I see a couple other, real quick, I see other couple of familiar names here in the crowd, uh, Colleen and April, hello. And um, well, anyway, <laughs> back to my origin in Minnesota. Um, yeah, I was really annoyed as a kid by how few times I'd see Minnesota mentioned in literature. I picked up, you know, whatever I could read um, in terms of um, genre fiction, contemporary fiction, nonfiction. And I just didn't see a lot of people writing stories that took place in Minnesota or stories about Minnesota historically. You know, with a few exceptions, I mean, of, of course there's, um, you know, like uh, Faith Sullivan, John Hassler, Louise Erdrich, but I don't know, I, I wanted more. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it had always been my dream to write uh, books for that person, books for uh, the kid uh, sitting on his bed with a flashlight at night, like looking for stories of, of his hometown and home state and the people he knew growing up. But I also wanted to write for my mom and I think she's the reason I write. Um, she was a writer herself, got an English degree from the University of Wisconsin River Falls when I was a little kid. She graduated uh, when I was about nine. And um, before then she would use her <laughs> homework as a bedtime story and would read to me from Chaucer and <laughs> Jorge Luis Borges and stuff like that. <laughs> so um, yeah, I didn't get it. Uh, yeah, both of those authors were pretty well over my head uh, when I was seven, but what I understood perfectly was um, her love for literature and her love for books. And I thought nothing would be more impressive than if I wrote a book for my mom. So when I was a little kid, I took my favorite book at the time, which was Richard Scarry's Cars and Trucks and Things That Go and wrote, written by Ryan Straddle on the inside cover. And I presented it to my mom who said, uh, yeah, that's not how you write a book there. <laughs> uh, so uh, she said, you got to come up with the words yourself. 
And after thinking about it for a little bit, I discovered that that was a superior option. I was really excited to do that. And I remember the first time I was assigned a short story as a assignment in class was in third grade, Nancy Techham's class. And she just told us to write a short story. It could be as long as we wanted. I asked, how long can it be? <laughs> Probably the only student who asked that. Uh, and mine ended up being eight pages long, single spaced. And, uh, it was called The Party. And I think about, oh, two thirds of that was um, a list of people invited to the party. So I had a lot to learn about plot, uh, character development, um, narrative flow, but I knew I wanted to create worlds and populate them. And I knew I wanted to create world, be super inclusive with my narratives and include people that I, I knew growing up and, and populated the world around me. But I didn't know any writers, like I said. I didn't know, I mean, other than maybe one or two literary events I'd been to at the library in Hastings, I hadn't even seen any or knew that they could be real people other than one time in grade school when I wrote my favorite author in third grade, Heron, uh, Helen Roney Sattler, uh, who wrote Dinosaurs of North America. And she wrote back uh, from her home in Montana. Um, and I thought, wow, someone is literally out there writing books. I couldn't believe it. And I felt like I need to do that. But like I said, not knowing anyone, not knowing anyone who really knew anyone, I was disabused from the idea of trying to make a living as an author, as a kid. My dad said, you should try to find work in something that pays you well enough to support writing on the side. And I think that's generally pretty sound advice. Um, yeah, and so I decided to uh, attend Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where I majored in radio TV film. I thought it'd be be neat to do some kind of creative job um, right in the mornings and on the weekends. And that's what I ended up doing. I was too chicken to major in creative writing. Thought I still thought prose was pretty hard. It is. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> writing a novel is about the hardest thing you can do. And that's even if you love doing it. Um, but I felt like uh, it would be, oh, I don't know, easier to work in entertainment. <laughs> I hope some of you are laughing if you live here in Southern California. Um, so after I graduated, I moved to Los Angeles, where uh, I ended up working mostly in television, mostly in unscripted and reality television for 14 years. And that's what supported me while I wrote uh, first short stories and eventually novel manuscripts. I worked on a number of TV series. I started at VH1 in 1999, about a year after I moved out and um, worked on a number of sh very short-lived series there before joining some ex-colleagues at The Bachelorette when it was still in, at the end of season one. I don't know what season they're on now, but I only worked on the first two seasons or so of Bachelorette before leaving them and uh, working on a TBS show called Outback Jack, and then eventually moving to Original Productions where I worked on um, Deadliest Catch, Ice Road Truckers, and a few different series within the Storage Wars franchise, including Storage Wars Texas, which is what I was working on while I wrote my first novel, Kitchens of the Great Midwest. Uh, I would write before work in the morning and on weekends, uh, especially Saturdays. And use, sticking to that discipline, I wrote the first draft of Kitchens in about a year in 2013. Uh, I'd been thinking about it for four years before sitting down to write it. And, and I'd been saving money to take time off and write, which uh, thankfully I was able to do when Storage Wars Texas wasn't renewed <laughs> and I was out of a job. Uh, typically people in my industry went scrambling for other work when that would happen. And I decided not to. I said, you know what? I'm going to finish this book. I'm, I've set out to do it. I'm going to figure it out. And with the help of uh, a writing mentor of mine uh, named Lou Matthews, who I met at the UCLA Extension uh, program, along with Eric Nussbaum, who was one of the last authors in this Pasadena Library program. He and I met in one of Lou's classes. Uh, I became a better writer. Uh, most of my life I'd been writing stuff that, well, you know, things I wanted to see in the world, which were things said in the Midwest and with Minnesotans and Midwesterners, but also 
things I thought were funny and entertained me and my friends. And Lou is the first person uh, to tell me your work is going to get a lot better once you start writing about things you care about. And <laughs> I thought, yeah, I think he's right. <laughs> I was just a little too chicken once again to really apprehend those things. And probably the most flagrantly ignored part of my mind and heart during that period was my mom's death. I'd been really depressed that, for among other things, that she hadn't lived to see any of my writing get published. I published my first short story about a year after she died. And when it became clear to me that I should write to her and for her, it became a lot easier. It became a lot easier to tell the stories of complex characters. It became a lot easier to troubleshoot my narratives when they were a conversation with her. When I was thinking like, well, what would she think? Or what would she want this character to do? Or what would she think would be funny? So in a, in a sense, um, you know, she's the reader I write for. Uh, so with Kitchens, uh, I sat down, you know, and wrote these people and wrote her into some of these characters. And, and in a sense, felt like uh, I was keeping her alive and also working through my own grief and grief process by writing that book. And, and it's continued in the book since. Um, so with Kitchens, um, you know, I didn't have an agent, didn't know how to get an agent. I talked to friends. Uh, I'd been hosting a literary series with my friend Summer at 826 LA where we volunteer, um, helping kids with homework and after school creative projects. Um, I'd been running, co-running a program with Summer called Hot Dish, which was a literary and culinary fundraiser for 826. And through that, I'd met a number of writers just by hosting them, just by asking them to come read their work uh, to raise money for this nonprofit. And so some of them were generous enough with their time to uh, talk to me about how to submit, how to write a query letter. I met a, a woman that I booked for a panel at 826LA who um, it turned out specialized in query writing. Sorry, I'm just going to move around to get out of the sunlight coming in. Um, and she helped me with my query. Her name's Amy. Um, and then, you know, uh, with, with the other writers asking them about their agents, could I query your agent, that kind of thing. And yeah, they, they helped me out. And I think about that a lot when people ask me that question, I help them out. If any of you are aspiring writers yourself and want help in that regard, I'm happy to do it. I'll say that right now. Find me online. My one of my email addresses is right on my website. Send me, and I will talk to you about it uh, to the best of my ability, and help help you figure out what the what your next step is. So, yeah, I wouldn't be here without someone else, someone else, and other people lowering their ladders to me. And thankfully, through them, I got some pretty good advice. One of which was follow the enthusiasm. So when I um, was querying agents and had interest from a couple agents. I flew out to New York to meet them in person. And from that experience, chose one. And um, he started, he put kitchens out to market. And within about eight days, I uh, had multiple offers. And I chose one based on um, her assessment of what the narrative was. I remember asking her, what's my book about? And I liked her answer. I wanted to be in complete agreement with my editor on that topic. <laughs> I didn't want an editor who saw a different book or saw the bones of a book that uh, they could mold into their uh, product of their own vision. I wanted someone who saw what I was doing and understood it and could make it better. And I chose correctly. Uh, and I've been with that editor ever since. I'm right now working on my third book with her. Um, but. I don't mean to skip over the second one. That's why we're here today. Lager Queen of Minnesota. This is my reading copy. It's covered in stickers from breweries and bookstores I've visited on the tour, including Blackstack Brewery here, which I haven't visited yet, but I will be there in about two weeks. They're making a beer that I mentioned in this book, a fictional beer. I made up for this book called Blots Light. They're actually making it in real life, so it won't be fictional anymore. 
their, <laughs> their blot's light will almost certainly be better than the blots I describe in the narrative. I hope, I imagine, <laughs> um, because I don't describe the blot's light in the book very generously, uh, other than it's meant to be drank in quantity. And one of my favorite parts of the book, which I don't get to read very often, is the part where Helen, who's the brewer who invents Blot's Light, in fact, I have her in the book as pretty much being the inventor of light beer in America um, around the time it was invented um, or successfully marketed anyway. Versions of it had been invented uh, but weren't successful until the 70s. So I wanted Helen Blot's my, you know, one of the, lager queens of Minnesota to invent a light beer and try to figure out how to market it, considering by the mid 1970s, no one had successfully done that yet. Um, so I created this scene where she and her husband, um, Orville, and their business partner, Joe Foxworth, uh, come up with an ad campaign for Blot's Special Light. Helen Norville took out a small loan to help buy ad space and produce local spots. And even if it would suck up over half the funds, Joe Foxworth was still convinced that they needed a celebrity pitch man. And that's where he proved his value. Hey, I know a guy, he told Helen one afternoon, running up to her as she was leaving the bathroom. My brother's freshman year roommate at Augustana was in training camp with the Minnesota Vikings. His name's Rudd Herzog. He said he'd do it. Helen wasn't really listening, so she was impressed. You have a friend on the Vikings? Well, he didn't make the team, but he, he lasted until final cuts. Oh, so he's not actually on the Vikings then? No, Joe said, but he's a big man. He still looks like a football player, but he isn't one and no, nobody's heard of him. No, Joe said, but trust me. So using his own money, Joe shot a spec commercial with Rudd Herzog, which Helen and Orville weren't even aware of until he showed it to them on his home film projector. Joe flicked out the lights and the image of a giant bearded man wearing an unspecific football jersey appeared on a pull down screen. Hi, I'm Rudd Herzog, the man said. You probably don't remember me from my career on the Vikings. It was my lifelong dream to play for them. Last year, I had my one chance and I didn't make it. That was real depressing. We've all had days like that, I guess. But after getting cut, I felt like drinking a lot of beer. Thank goodness my local, my local bar had Blot's Special Light. With its easygoing flavor and low calories, you can drink a ton of them. You can drink it all night and you'll feel all right. Drink lots, it's Blot's. It's kind of sad, Helen said. I don't know. Well, I like it, said Orville. He speaks for a lot of people right now. Joe nodded. Yeah, I sure hope he does. All right, so that's how that slogan was invented for Blot's Special Light. In reality, that slogan was invented by my friend Diana Kowalski in Seattle, who's, um, uh, who was working for REI at the time and who works in internal communications and is very good at coming up with slogans. <laughs> so all credit to Diana, um, who also was the uh, name inspiration for the character Diana in this book. Um, yeah, and Blatz, um, yeah, fictional beer, you know, of course, sounds kind of like Blatz, which if you were from the northern, northern Midwest region and uh, lived there in between the 50s and the 80s, you've heard of Blatz. But I made sure to mention Blatz in this book, so no one would, thought, no one would think I was just stealing Blatz. But anyway. Um, yeah, certainly a lot of a lot of inspirations for this chapter that are very regionally specific, uh, including the character Rudd Herzog, uh, kind of based on Bunch Warmer Bob, who was, uh, you know, kind of an erstwhile Vikings player, uh, <laughs> uh, who was a spokesperson for various uh, commercial concerns in, in Minnesota in the 70s and 80s. And uh, even the name, well, Rudd Herzog is a little more local. Um, named after my, my friend Rudd, who um, I used to watch Vikings games with um, uh, in Van Nuys, where he lived. Um, and he had, he had a big uh, Werner Herzog poster on his wall behind his television. 
So I put that character name together to honor him specifically, uh, Jim Rutherford and his wife, Nancy. And uh, unfortunately they both passed away before this book came out. So they didn't get to see um, uh, this, this scene in print, but um, as, as authors are wont to do, you know, I find ways of honoring things and people that are important to me. And that's, that's the inspiration for that. Uh, for Red Herzog, for that name is my my good friend Jim Rutherford, who I watched every uh, Vikings game with uh, when possible for over a decade here in California. Um, yeah, and there was one other piece I wanted to read that I don't get to read very often. Um, also has kind of an unusual inspiration. Um, later on in the book, Edith, Helen's sister, uh, becomes a brewer herself. And uh, it's a bit of a shocking turn of events for Edith as she hates beer and doesn't drink it. <laughs> so through a accident of family dynamics, she's put in the position of being helpful to, to a relative, which does come naturally to Edith. And in this case, being helpful to a relative means temporarily taking over her granddaughter's craft brewery operation. <laughs> <laughs> during which she has the opportunity to make her own beer. And uh, she decides to, uh, as someone who dislikes every beer she's drank until now, try to figure out what kind of beer she would like. And she's an accomplished baker. Her strawberry rhubarb pie has won awards. At one point, it was considered the third best pie in Minnesota. And um, decides to put that in a beer. And I'd read about this happening. I'd read about a... Uh, collaboration that Evan Kleiman from KCRW's Good Food had done with the brewery down in Orange County and uh, a pie in a bottle kind of beer. Not a strawberry rhubarb pie exactly, but that concept. So I thought it's been done, it can, it can be done. And I'm gonna have Edith do it. And um, there's a very, in the novel, there's a very difficult to please beer critic named um, Pete Flavor Dave Michaels. And Flavor Dave infamously has never given a 100 out of 100 score. In fact, he rarely even gives a 90 or an 80. He gives most beers, you know, somewhere between zero and 20. Uh, <laughs> he's the hard bitten, cynical, hipster critic that you hate. And he's handed this bottle of beer made by a grandma who dislikes beer and has never made beer before. And this is what he thinks of it. This is a column from Independent Brewer, September 20th, 2018, the review of Grandma Edith's rhubarb pie and a bottle of ale from Artemis Brewery by Pete Flavor Dave Michaels. Let's all take a step back from the ledge people. Let's remember that those of us who are old enough to drink in America were born in a country where the vast majority of beer was piss poor lager made by a tiny handful of companies. If you claim you love any of that watery effluence now, it's either because you've tethered it to some insidious nostalgia, or because you're too cheap to drink anything better. Either way, when your liver kills you out of spite, it's your own damn fault. I hope that your city coroner has the guts to call your death a suicide. Since every other product in the world is rapidly becoming what beer was in 1975, and for the same reasons, let's pause at this moment. It's a glorious time, perhaps never to be seen again. And even as I write this, my fridge rattles 20 feet away from me crowded with 13 varieties of beer from 21 different brewers, all of which I can personally visit and under a, and under a 30 minute drive. I already weep for the inevitable demise of this era and most of all, its ability to surprise me. As you know, I buy most of my beer at Craig's Wine and Spirits in Dinkytown, half of it special ordered by KT, the smartest and therefore angriest woman in customer service. Last night, KT immediately handed me a six pack of something called Grandma Edith's Rhubarb Pie in a Bottle, told me to go home, drink it, and shut up. She helpfully added that if I didn't like it, then something must be wrong with me because every white hipster who she had the tolerance to remember had come in either to buy it or ask about it. The hipster crowd does love an unlikely origin story, and this is a memorable one. The brewer Artemis is operating out of Nicollet Falls, Minnesota, and the brewmaster, Diana Winter, is the same ex Heartlander employee who brewed her first IPA there at age 19. 
Now, she's hanging her own shingle, but before you confuse it for some bootstrapped operation, you should keep in mind that she's got professional facilities and relationships far beyond the reach of most first-time brewmasters. With these home field advantages, she needs, she needs to be up to something different to be respected. And indeed, there is some super freaky stuff happening at that brewery, starting with the girls on her payroll. Ms. Winter's entire production team is a cadre of women over 65, all of whom happen to be grandmothers, and one of whom is apparently this Edith. I had my doubts, but it's the real thing. For better or for worse, an actual Grandma Edith made this beer. That's not even my favorite thing about it. My favorite thing about it is that it's just okay. And before I, sh I should explain why that's my favorite thing in the world, you should hunt this stuff down and drink as much of it as possible because this beer represents something that is nearly extinct from every shelf and every store in America. This beer doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fill any obvious market niche, meet a known customer demand, or pursue any recognizable trend. This beer is merely the ultimate expression of its brewer, a 79-year-old woman named Edith, who has next to no internet footprint and one millionth the social media presence of my neighbor's two-year-old. What little exists about Edith online indicates that she worked at a nursing home where her pies were enough of a foodie fetish to turn the joint into a brutal Friday night dinner reservation. But there was nothing to indicate any access or interest in brewing until, of course, this pie in a bottle which seems like a smoking gun of a correlation. Now, this beer has a fluffy pink two-finger head and smells like malty rhubarb, so it's certainly not out to fool anybody. But no flavor notes I write, however, are sufficient. And in many ways, they're beside the point. Even the, as the primal forces that made the beer of the 1970s out of the beer of the 1870s recast their shadows, hope remains in this specific bottle because all of the chemists, focus groups, AI, and boardrooms in the world will never create a beer like Grandma Edith's. This beer is flawed, wonderful, and strange in a way only a certain kind of individual could devise. It renders every other beer on the shelf a faceless SKU. Grandma Edith was just making a beer that she wanted to drink because it didn't exist yet. And the result is not a beer in the sense that you know it. It is the heart and guts and ignorance and beauty and dreams of Edith Magnuson. And that is all it is. God bless it and God bless America. Rating 100 out of 100. Editor's note, Flavor Dave is now on an infinite sabbatical. All right, so that's, that's Flavor Dave. And he came out of um, me wanting to challenge somebody like that. Because <laughs> I, I met a lot of beer snobs <laughs> while researching this book. And um, I also, you know, lived in Chicago in the 90s and um, was in a a band that didn't fit within the realm of what was critically lauded in the music scene there. And, you know, particularly by, by folks like Steve Albini, who, um, you know, I don't think it's uncharitable to call him um, <laughs> cranky, um, <laughs> but he's certainly a, um, a, a very astute critic. And one of my favorite pieces of his writing was his uh, review of a Slint album which is the most fulsome and elaborate praise you'd ever read. And I love it when an otherwise, you know, grouchy hip critic is forced to be happy and talk about something they love. <laughs> and I was very taken with the possibility of doing that with this character and uh, sat down to write that and uh, let him loose on Edith. And, and I need this bottle, but also through that got to talk about some of the things that I noticed uh, while researching this book. This book, like um, Christine said, took me to uh, 15 states and you know several dozen breweries. Uh, two and a half years of research went into this book. I did not make my own beer, uh, but I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> just about anything I could have conceived of making has been made already or was being made. Um, and one of the things I kept seeing again and again as the years passed was uh, an interest in new brewers coming up to make something that wasn't being made already in their area uh, to help get them on the map and assert their, their personality to the consumers in the area. So yeah, I was really driven by the proliferation of these breweries, particularly where I'm from, where um, in a lot of small towns, you know, we see stores like Walmart, Dollar General, um, Subway come in and, you know, 
somewhat flatten the landscape and make it seem somewhat homogenous. Um, if a, when I was on my book tour for my first book, quite often I'd end up in small Midwestern towns and quite often the host, whether if they be a bookstore employee or a librarian would ask me if I'd been to the local brewery um, because that was their pride of place. That's a place in town that doesn't exist anywhere else. Locally owned, making a local product for locals. It's a neat thing. And um, I was surprised to have learned in my research that that was once much more common in America when it came to breweries, that about 20 years before prohibition due to all the German and Czech immigration to the US, there were thousands and thousands of breweries across the US in much the same way they are now, um, making local beer for locals. And yeah, I was absolutely intrigued by that. And that was, um, one of my major inspirations for sitting, to write, sitting down to write Lager Queen was getting to the bottom of this. Um, why is this happening now? And who's doing it? What are their motivations? And what, what effect is it happening? So I created three characters and Diana, Helen, and Edith, who didn't know anything about beer at the time. You meet them as a reader and put them each on their own individual course to learn about beer and teach me, the writer, about beer. So in essence, their questions motivated whatever knowledge I have. I tried not to overload the book with too much brewery lingo, uh, that excerpt aside, <laughs> the fluffy pink two finger head and so on. Um, but I tried to keep it to what they needed to know. There were times where um, I'd go to a brewery just to answer a question that a character had, like how to make a chocolate stout and also how to screw up a chocolate stout since they probably wouldn't get it in one. So <laughs> what's a good honest mistake for a first time brewer making a chocolate stout? Um, and because I live here in LA County, I live in Burbank now, um, a lot of those inquiries were made to local brewers like Craftsman in Pasadena um, and um, you know uh, Dogtown in Atwater and most, um, probably most importantly, uh, Three Weavers in Inglewood. Uh, between craftsmen and three weavers, I got an awful lot of information that informed this book. So it wasn't just Midwest breweries and beers that inspired me. It was the ones right here in California. You can go to a bar and a store and have, have tonight and uh, market craftsmen in Mali at um, three weavers were incredibly helpful to me. And um, they were thanked in the acknowledgments. <laughs> but yeah, I. I'd say we're getting close to the point where I should start taking questions from the audience. I just wanna say again, uh, thanks again for being here, for uh, you know, taking time out of your life to um, spend time with an author. You know, There's a lot of things you could be doing on a Tuesday evening. There's a lot of great other books out there. There's many, there's too many. Uh, <laughs> you know, A lot of great buzzy TV shows you could be watching. So, Thanks again for taking your time. It means a lot to me that you'd be here. And if you have any questions, uh, I want to leave plenty of time for it because I tend to be digressive, so, <laughs> as you may have noticed. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open, whatever you got. Let's hear it. Thank you very much, Jay Ryan. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. So you grew up with your mother reading to you Chaucer while you didn't really understand it. So, <laughs> but but you liked the words or the rhythm of them, or the sound of them, or the enjoyment of having someone read to you yeah. is probably what really meant to you a lot of it. So do you have an all-time favorite book? Oh, wow. Boy, that's tough. Probably the book that I've bought the most because I give it away to people is Jesus' Son by Dennis Johnson. It's a book of short stories. Yeah, that, yeah, probably that. That's probably the book I've read the most and given away the most and bought the most. Okay, and your first short story was a very long short story <laughs> listing all of the friends that came to your party. Yeah, yeah. And you learned that. So um, do you still go to the UCLA extension course or you would recommend to everyone oh, I, that is a reader or I'd absolutely, possibly I'd has absolutely, a child? Oh, I'd absolutely a, recommend that. Yeah, no, that was a, a very, um, what's the word, performative? Um, developmental course for me as a writer. I mean, like I said, I, I only 
I didn't major in creative writing in college. I only took one creative writing class at Northwestern. Uh, so really, I didn't have any formal education in prose or any workshop experience until UCLA Extension. So my instructors there, Robert Berge and, and Lou Matthews, were crucial to me in helping me understand how to make my writing better and um, what I needed to concentrate on, I think, to make that possible. But also finding a peer group, um, making friends there that I still have to this day um, that read my work and I read their work. And, you know, for example, that, yeah, it's where, where I met Eric Nussbaum, who just presented his book, Stealing Home, through the Pasadena Public Library a couple weeks ago. And yeah, we both had Lou Matthews as our instructor. <laughs> so I feel like Lou is kind of, uh, he's kind of the glue that holds, holds a number of us together and has been really influential to a lot of us. And his own book is coming out on August 24th, Shaky Town, just set here in Los Angeles where he grew up. And um, super proud of him. I'm so happy to see it. It's coming out on a Prospect Park Books, which is uh, based in Pasadena. Yeah. So yeah, so I've got to promote that too. He's, uh, it's a wonderful collection. And uh, yeah, and I'll be a part of one of his events in October at uh, Chevalier's. And hopefully that will happen uh, safely. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yes, we hope so very much. So, so someone that started off the first question that talked about Wolf Lake, is that a special lake or something that meant something to all of you in Minnesota? Oh, Wolf, Wolf lake? lake? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Um, no, was... I'm just from Minnesota and I the shout out like Hastings. Everybody oh, you're from, has oh. Their, yeah, so oh, awesome. I, I transplant. So I was like, oh, hey, I love Wolf it. Lake. I love it. Awesome. Awesome. It's a town of 53. So Oh wow. <laughs> where's the where, where's the where's the next largest town? Where, where's it close to that I might know? Park Rapids. Oh Detroit sure, it's Lake. up there. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Oh, that's so cool. I love that area. So I really enjoy the the Minnesota. That's what I, I was kind of wondering. What do people, um, you know, other readers who are not in Minnesota connection? I mean, do they ever comment on some of the things that <laughs> you include? Yeah, yeah. I've had a number of readers tell me they don't believe someone like Edith could exist, that they find her to be unrealistic. Um, she's, as, as a Minnesotan, you would know that she isn't at all. Uh, <laughs> she's very, Edith in particular is very directly based on several women in my life, um, all of whom are Minnesotans or North Dakotans. And um, I'd always wanted to read about read about a woman like Edith. And I just didn't see them pop up a lot in literature. So I felt I, I had to write her. Um, and yeah, I, I hope there's many more. I hope um, many more authors take on the challenge of writing a character like Edith Magnuson because uh, they run the world, man. They're, <laughs> they get stuff done <laughs> and they do it with a smile and a lack of complaint. Well, everyone's thanking you for the way you captured Minnesota nice, which really oh. ties into, it ties into um, your question just right now. So they want to know what's your favorite top three beers? And oh, what is boy. the furthest brewery that you've traveled to in all those 61 um, places you went to for your book? Wow. Um, and what is the, what's your flavor brewery that you've traveled to? Wow, the farthest was the Pilsner or Cal Brewery in Pilsen, Czech Republic. Whoa, um, that's a good place. Yeah, it was neat. Um, let's see. Um, the first question, top three. Your no top three. No particular order. One, one thing I have an awful lot of in my fridge right now, or as much as I can handle, is Pliny the Elder from Russian River. No, that's kind of an obvious choice. It's like, you know, asking a fan of like Napa cab what their favorite wine is and them saying like Camus or Silver Oak or something you know it's like it's it's a it's a low-hanging fruit but it's there and I love it I love that beer I also really enjoy uh zombie dust from uh Three Floyds I've got some of that in my fridge and I also you know uh gotta say uh like the beer from Blackstack who's making um the Blotz beer everything I've had from Blackstack is phenomenal uh, particularly like Whippets, which was a hop lager. So yeah, I, I really, um, I've been lucky to try a lot of beer, but 
those are the first three that come to mind. Um, also a big fan of three weavers here in LA County and um, oh, plenty of the beer up in um, the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, I just can't go wrong. We had a great experience uh, two months ago, my family uh, at Crux uh, Fermentation Project in Bend uh, in particular, we just love Crux. So yeah, I don't know, start there. Give it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like there's a lot more than just three. <laughs> Three that oh are yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah, yeah. I can't pick just one. Yeah, you can't just I, pick this one. Okay. No, no, no. So, uh, and what what was the third part of the question again? There was a well. Which is the furthest way that you went? Was which is the Czech Republic? Mm -hmm. What is the top favorite three? And what is your favorite brewery he traveled to? Oh boy! Well, I I might have to say the one in my hometown of Hastings, Spiral Brewery, just because they were so transparent. I mean, every brewer I went to gave me like a private tour and gave me insight into their uh, marketing and brewing practices. But that was the brewery that really taught me about finances and was very transparent to me about how much it costs to run a brewery, both in terms of startup and operation. And I felt I needed to know that for when Diana opens a brewery in Lager Queen. And that was the one brewery I spoke to that just laid it all out for me, like in terms of hard numbers, so that this is what it costs. And, and that was especially important to me because Diana's working with in the same geographical region as Spiral. So running up against kind of very similar obstacles in terms of, oh, you know, trying to find a bank that understands how to structure a loan for a brewery and understanding that, oh, this business won't be making any money for the first 18 months or so of the loan. <laughs> where they're still building out the space. Um, so yeah, stuff like that. I don't want to get too in the weeds with it, <laughs> but I thought, oh boy, what a what an honor and privilege. They weren't open yet when I was writing the book. So my experience at Spiral was entirely theoretical and financial. I didn't have their beer until after the book came out. I went there on my book tour and it was my first time drinking their beer. Well, you did a lot of original research and learned a lot in, through this whole process of doing this. And you said you thought about writing this book for quite a while, or mm -hmm. your first book. First book yeah, my first book about four years, but this one, this book came out in 2019 and I'd started working on it 2015. So about, oh yeah, about four years. About this four years. Me to write a novel, yeah. So your stories are so character driven. Do you outline, how, how do you write? Do you outline or you just start writing with the characters in mind and see where it goes? Yeah, and then I outline later. I outline once I've written about two or 300 pages. So yeah. um, you said that you still get up in the morning and write? Um, yeah, yesterday I woke up at 4.30. Today I got up at a more reasonable hour at seven. Um, it depends, like if I'm up, I'm up and I'm, if my mind's turning, go upstairs and get to work. But, you know, I've got a family now. Um, my wife works part-time. My son's 20 months old. He, uh, <laughs> he needs a lot of attention and, um, Brooke and I alternate it. So, you know, um, every so often she's kind enough to give me uh, the space to write all day, but that can't happen like it used to. So working around the imperatives of family life is a new obstacle, but it's a nice one. You know, uh, certainly those of you who are parents understand that uh, having a child, um, you know, kind of twists the Rubik's cube of your mind a little, a little bit in terms of perspective and <laughs> and understanding and also um understanding of what your own parents went through <laughs> and since the um characters in the book i'm writing right now are parents of young children it's timely uh so i'm putting a lot of what i'm experiencing in the last year and a half uh into the book i'm presently writing so well we will certainly all look forward to that Thanks. that book when it comes out so um a lot of um, readers are saying they just reread Lager Queen and came across oh, a nice. page Thorvald, owner of the Mountain Central Brewery. That's right. Any, any relationship to Lars? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Paige is a cousin. Yeah, a cousin of Eva. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. second cousin. Yeah, it's certainly part of the same family. Very perceptive readers. That's awesome. Yeah, well, yeah, that was delighted really, to be able to ask you. I was really slid in there as, as sort of a, my way of honoring here in South Dakota, which has been one of my favorite places uh, as an author on a book tour, uh -huh. so sure 
incredibly warm audience there and very, very enthusiastic and perceptive readers and just a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, welcoming crowd there. And so I put that in there, Mountain Central, like there's a town right outside of here called Fort Pierre where, where the line between Mountain and Central time zone is. And so I thought I'd put a brewery there <laughs> on, the, on the, like right on the other side of the time, uh, in the opposite time zone is Pierre. So um, in Page, the name Page is a reference to the bookstore there, Prairie Pages. So yeah, it's, there's a lot, yeah. I, I don't know, I'm one of those authors that doesn't name things lightly. Uh, there's a lot of Easter eggs for very specific places and people throughout the book, but Paige Thorvald is also uh, an Easter egg to careful readers who remember Lars and Eva from the first one. Yeah, it's very special to people that go through and know um, that area of the United States. The Midwest. Yeah, it's, it's rare. Yeah. It's a very small town for a capital. Uh, one of the smallest capitals in the U.S. population-wise. So I think they really appreciated having an author visit, and I appreciated them. It's a wonderful place. So you talk about um, you grew up going to your local library, so you take your son to oh, yeah, yeah, the library? Yeah, he loves it. He loves it. Oh, my God. He loves books. You know, he does the same thing I used to, put them on the, flat on the ground, sit with them, pour over them. You know, he he bites them more than I'd like, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, and yeah, he loves the local library here in Burbank. I felt so relieved when we were able to um, get him inside, you know, and spend time in there safely with him. Uh, yeah, so, that's very, very nice when we could open up all of our libraries and have everyone be able to go back to them. Very, yeah. very, very important. So um, you have this wonderful cover of the Logger Queen of Minnesota. Oh, yeah. And I've only ever seen one cover of it, but your book, the um, the kitchens of the great Midwest, mm -hmm. I've seen lots of different covers. So, but you've had the same agent the whole time. Yeah. So she mm -hmm. just wanted to stay with the same cover. Yeah, I guess, I don't know who decides this, but the foreign markets who, um, overseas markets who bought uh, Lager Queen, uh -huh. um, kept the basic cover design as well as the uh, paperback team at Penguin kept the cover design from Viking. So um, it's a great cover. You know, I really need to shout out who did it because I, I love it. I remember when they sent me it. It was it, it is a great it's a great cover and it's very nice that they kept it. And I understand this it's um, written in German as well, translated into German. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see. And of course, why. if you think of all of the beer houses in Germany, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, um, yeah. I'm looking at the color. The German market would, would pick it up. Oh, book designed by Megan Kavanaugh and Cassandra Garuzzo. Okay. Anyway, like they did a stupendous job. Uh, I remember seeing that cover for the first time and just being floored. And yeah, yeah, very similar culture in Germany. Like they've been at it. <laughs> for a while <coughs> and um it seems to be doing well over there i'm hearing uh very nice things from uh, german language readers and um you know uh, my, my publisher there is based in switzerland but um um you know throughout germany austria switzerland um i feel like uh you know it's surreal it's very i feel very fortunate to, to reach those readers as well with this book yeah that's wonderful but now also, we've I've read that your book is possibly being serialized for TV. Yeah, or I see. Have you talked with if you talked with um, the writers or the script writers or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we had a pitch meeting today that I was able to sit in on. It's out of my hands, you know. There, I optioned it to a a, a production company that's pitching it, you know, looking for a network. Uh, so, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, it would be neat. It would be uh, a little different than the narrative you see in the book, but. It would be one I approve of. Um, yeah. So we'll do you visualize who, what um, actors or actresses <laughs> you want to play the part? Oh boy, I hate. Have? Oh, I don't know. I didn't when I was writing. I can't now. Uh, I'll leave that to you. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, well, we'll end on that, so everyone can visualize if, when your book is put on t on TV, or maybe it'll become a movie. Um, they can say that they actually met. J. Ryan Strondel at Pasadena Public Library. 
And we thank you so much for joining us today and taking your time to present your wonderful book and talk about your experience. And we're all very anxious, looking forward to your new book. Can you give us any hints about your new book and when we might be able to see it, read I, it? No, I don't know. It's largely set at a supper club in uh, Northern Minnesota, close to where Dan Anderson is from. Um, in that area, generally between Park Rapids and Grand Rapids. Um, but I'm still working on it. Uh, <laughs> you know how, uh, how police detectives say, at least on TV, that they can't discuss um, an investigation uh, <laughs> in process. Uh, I feel kind of the same way. It's just a little, but in my case, it's just a little too mutable. Um, I don't even, I'm not even quite sure of the title anymore. For a long time, I've been calling it Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club. It could change. So we'll see. Um, hopefully next year. M not sure yet, though. Um, yeah, wow. just uh, uh, I'm going to keep working at it. I'm going to write the best book I can and hope for the best. Well, you have written two very best books. Thanks. Thank you very much for being um, on our program, part of Authors and Their Journey series at the library and um, how you build your characters. Thank you very much for visiting with us today. Thanks so much. It means a lot for you all to be here. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you all to all of our attendees. And we'll look forward to welcoming you to our next author and their journey series. Good night. Bye-bye.